Well, I just got the cue from Laura that I need, I'm the one that has to kick everything off. So good morning. Nice to see everybody. It is nice to have, what do we have here? About 20 folks in the PSRC boardroom. That is a nice change. We just had a uh, PSRC board meeting yesterday. We had two board members in person. But it's nice. We're, we're kind of getting in the swing of things. Let me introduce myself. I'm Josh Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Puget Sound Regional Council. Thank you for being here. Out of the gate, I want to give a big thanks to co-chairs of PSRC's TOD effort, Patience Malaba and, uh, and David Killingstad for, for their fantastic leadership and, and the work that they do. So transit-oriented development. Um, this is our future in the Puget Sound region. Between now and 2050, we're going to see the Puget Sound region grow by about 40%. We're expecting back the napkin of about 1.7 million PSRC region. And we're doing something that is not being done across the United States. We're planning for that growth to be within the confines of the urbanized footprint that we have today. What does that mean? It means uh, we're not going to sprawl out and build more subdivisions further away from jobs and from hubs. We're going to concentrate that growth within the urban growth area along station corridors and hopefully as close to stations as possible. Puget Sound Regional Council about two years ago adopted our long range plan for the region called Vision 2050. Now, I was a board member when we adopted Vision 2040 about a decade prior. We hadn't yet opened up our first light rail line, Puget Sound region, when we adopted Vision 2040. So I think for a lot of us as elected officials, it was hard to get our minds wrapped around the transformational power of these transit investments. When we adopted Vision 2050, we knew the region had changed. We knew for the first time to count on decades of investments of high capacity transit. Light rail gets a lot of attention as it should, but we have uh, dozens of bus rapid transit corridors that are coming online. Just up in uh, up in uh, Linwood, there was a celebration for the Orange Line uh, groundbreaking. Transit has been an amazing partner to uh, leverage bus rapid transit in, in, uh, in their transit district. We see passenger only ferry expansions of course, we have opportunities as it applies to uh, the Sounder Heavy Rail Line. And some of the work we're going to be doing at PSRC with partners is looking even further ahead of what may be uh, a part of a Sound Transit 4, Sound Transit 5, what is high speed or ultra high speed rail connection. This is our future. And we're making billions of dollars of investments. The public is making billions of dollars investments. We have to get the most out of these investments. Now, the best opportunity we have to meet our climate goals as a region, the best opportunity we have to meet our affordable housing goals as a region, the best opportunity we have improvements uh, in be able to, to make a dent in our equity goals and aspirations as a region is through TOD. But it's not going to be easy. We know it's, it's difficult to, uh, to change suburban land use patterns to urban land use patterns. We know it's difficult going city by city in a, in a Puget Sound region with approximately 80 cities and towns. Now, I'm very mindful of the complexities for the development community, whether you're a nonprofit or for-profit, what that means to just get through the entitlement, get through the decision-making process, let alone everything else we have to line up. But we have to lean into this and get this right. And, you know, the thing I just want to challenge us on is I was born in the Bay Area. Uh, we moved up to the Puget Sound region. We were a Navy family in the early 90s. And I had the opportunity to then go back to college down in the Bay Area. And, you know, I tell you what, when I go down to the Bay Area and I see the BART system, it isn't too different from what was delivered in the 60s and 70s. You see dozens of BART stations that are underutilized, that don't have density around those stations. And, you know, the commitment when Bay Area voters uh, approved the BART system uh, over 50 years ago, one of the commitments that the BART system made was that there would always be enough free parking at every BART station. That was, that, that was in their ballot material to get folks to vote for it. So, you know, going into development of that system, 
know, unfortunately, there had to be a lot of compromises to deliver a high capacity transit system to the Bay Area that worked for suburban commuters. We have a different opportunity here in the Puget Sound region. We've been very intentional that our investments in high capacity transit are to leverage our land use decisions. And we have this opportunity in the next couple of years where every city and county in the Puget Sound region is going to be updating their comprehensive plans. They're going to be building off of our framework of Vision 2050, which for the first time calls for 70% of future growth, housing and jobs around these transit investments. This is our opportunity. But this is going to have to be a collaborative effort. Government can't get it done alone. We need the private sector, we need nonprofits, we need smart people that share our common uh, goal to get the most out of these investments. We need to come together and figure out how to do this hard work. And we're going to have bumps along the way. We're going to have mistakes. We're going to have unintended consequences. We just have to roll up our sleeves, keep our eyes on the prize, and get it done. So if that work happens in meetings like this. And I see a lot of friends and, and folks that I've known for a long time who are taking time out of your businesses and your day jobs to be here to collaborate and, and figure out what we need to do next. I thank you for your work and whatever we can do at the Puget Sound Regional Council to support all of you. We're always here. Thanks. So thank you, uh, Executive Director Brown, uh, for those introductory remarks. So good morning. We're thrilled that you could all join us this morning. I'm David Killingstad, co-chair of PSRC's Regional Transit-Oriented Development Committee, and I'm also the Long Range Planning Manager for Snohomish County. Happy to have this hybrid event to explore innovative techniques and best practices to help finance thriving and equitable transit-oriented development. I'm going to start off this morning here with a little bit of history to demonstrate how far the region has come. For those of you not familiar, the Growing Transit Community Strategy, or GTC as it's commonly referred to, uh, was an effort the region began nearly a decade ago to emphasize the importance of high capacity transit station areas in accommodating growth and shaping local communities throughout the region. It was supported by a federal sustainable communities initiative grant, a broad partnership of public, private, and non-governmental stakeholders came together to imagine the future of the region's transit corridors and to come to some common agreement about their role in the region. Some key goals emerged. They included attracting growth to these areas, preserve and create housing affordability, and ensure access to opportunity for all of the region's residents in transit corridors. Since the Growing Transit Community Strategy was adopted back in 2014, the voters and decision makers of the Central Puget Sound region have committed to making extraordinary levels of investment in high capacity transit, as uh, Executive Director Brown uh, just noted. PSRC has worked over the last two years to update the region's long range growth uh, management plan, uh, it's Vision 2050, High capacity transit station areas and the cities and communities that host them have been identified as critically important places to accommodate growth as we look out to house and employ the 1.8 million people and 1.2 million jobs forecast to come here uh, in this region by the year 2050. We have a lot of work ahead to make sure these systems become reality and to work to make the communities that surround them successful. We look forward to working with all of you who will be part of the important work to achieve the ambitious vision that the region is laying out for its future. But before we introduce today's panel, I'm gonna pass the mic to my uh, TOD co-chair patients to do a little bit of housekeeping. Excellent, thank you, David, uh, for grounding us in the history of this work. And Josh, really thank you for inspiring us and taking us back to our Vision 2050 TOD goals and how they tie to equity and TOD. And these kind of platforms are the places where we can advance those goals, collaborating collectively. So thank you for starting us off with such a great tone this morning. As introduced, I'm Patience Malaba, co-chair of PSRC Regional TOD Committee. And I'm also the executive director of the Housing Development Consortium. 
This is a hybrid meeting allowing for remote and in-person attendance. And I had earlier about 20 people in the room and it's really amazing. Uh, so for remote attendees, if you have a logistical question during the webinar, please use the chat feature and PSRC staff will assist you as always. If you have a question for the panelists, please use the Q&A feature to post your question. For those of you who are in the room in person, uh, please use the microphone when you wish to speak and turn off the microphone when you are done speaking. Uh, staff are in the room as always if you have any technical difficulties and need support. During the Q&A session of the panel, we will acknowledge questions from both the room and from those of you who are participating remotely. With that, I will pass over to Rick Crochalis, who is going to be introducing the panel and has a long history of planning work in our region from working with different government agencies, with different organizations, and now really leading this work uh, with the Ebonet Institute. Uh, and Rick, we're really honored to have you drive and lead this work. So over to you uh, to introduce the panel. Thanks, Patience. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Rick Richalis. I'm the co-chair of the ULI Northwest uh, TOD Council. And uh, ULI Northwest is really pleased to co-sponsor this event with PSRC's uh, Regional TOD Committee, we found we have a commonality of purpose, maybe coming from a little different perspective, and that collaboration I think is beneficial. Future, this is our first event we're, we're covering it together. Because uh, we really think that educating uh, the public, jurisdictions, the private sector um, on TOD and how we can, as Josh talked about, really take advantage of that major investment happening is, is really uh, important. Now, as David mentioned, successful TOD projects uh, really begin with good planning. But as we all know, no project gets built unless there's a market for that development. And most importantly, financing is in place. To understand it, we really talked about incentives for TOD as our topic today. Uh, we have a cross section of perspectives from financing and incentives, uh, the role of the private sector, public sector, and nonprofits such as ULI and, and Portera uh, to support that goal of equitable quality development around these transit stations that we've been talking about here this morning already. Um, uh, I've also uh, developed a, uh, an online and hand out for those in person, a um, uh, financing uh, a resource guide for all of the different tools, not only for the project specific, but for the infrastructure that's needed to support TOD, connecting the station with the end uses, the end uses of each other. So that's available to you online and uh, in person. So for our panel, our first speaker is John Heffelman planning partner of the law firm, Karen Cross and Hippelman, former chair of TOD's uh, national, realized national TOD Council, co-chair with me of the ULI Northwest TOD Council. John has closely studied the tremendous market growth of TOD nationally over the past two decades. John will be followed by Stacey Lewis, partner at the Pacifica Law Group, who specializes in public finance, representing a wide range of clients like university, county, cities, and special purpose districts. She's someone you really want to know to find creative and legal ways to generate new public revenue. Finally, our last panel member is Nick Bratton, who is Forterra's Senior Director of Policy and will address how a nonprofit land acquisition experience can be a vital leader in building equitable communities. Nick is someone you might want to have on your backpacking team, mountaineering guide, and is a certified swift water rescue technician. With that, I'll pass it to uh, John Heffelman, who is online and is giving the introduction to our panel. Well, good, good morning, everybody. Um, as um, Rick said, um, I am a private real estate development lawyer in Seattle, and um, I'm happy to uh, say that there's a coincidence um, or an alignment um, between what Josh Brown said earlier and what I'm going to say now. While the region is planning um, and facilitating a lot of development around our high capacity uh, trans um, nodes. The good news is, is that the private sector um, has also uh, focused on those high capacity transit nodes. Uh, 20 years ago, when 
I worked to join and we were forming the National Urban Land Institute Transit Oriented Development Council. Many, many people didn't know what TOD was. I think you all know that, you've had that experience. I remember giving presentations even 15 years ago when I would say to people, raise your hand if you know what TOD means. And you know, you'd have a few hands raised. Now everybody in the room would raise their hand and that's the good news. There's a recognition that this is the way we must grow. And certainly our clients um, and Stacy's clients um, in the real estate development industry have um, figured this out. <clears throat> The good news and the bad news is that our clients are all focused on doing projects around high capacity transit systems. The good news is that's the way we have to grow, as Josh put it. Um, there is a, no alternative. We cannot build more freeways and we can't build further out. The bad news is, is that all of this interest in doing it right, building in the urban areas, um, is a competitive force that's driving up the land costs around the light rail stations. I remember going, I remember going to clients 15 years ago and saying, change the way you look at your land acquisition. Stop looking for uh, plats, although they're still looking for plats where they can do single family uh, development. I said, focus on the urban areas and look around planned future light rail, and even bus rapid transit stations. And they have all done that. Um, so TOD is hot and that's the good news. I just came um, last week, we had our national ULI Transit Oriented Development Council meeting in San Diego. The same thing is happening there. They're making a huge investment in high capacity transit. Um, and as you know, in the LA metro region, it is intensely um, TOD, it has to be. Um, so financing, which is what we're gonna talk about mostly today, financing TOD was a problem when we started 20 years ago. There are more resources now than there were 20 years ago or 10 years ago but it's still a problem. Now I'm talking about financing the public infrastructure that we need to do good quality integrated transit oriented development around light rail and bus rapid transit stations. The private sector can raise the money because the banks and the investment funds and the insurance companies now appreciate the TOD is hot and money will follow the market, okay? So we're not having trouble getting capital for private development around um, high light rail stations, but we're still getting all kinds of trouble trying to find the public dollars or the mix of public and private dollars, one to build the infrastructure, the pedestrian, bicycle, the open space, and the affordable housing elements that you really need. If you're gonna have great TOD, you can't just have multifamily or mixed use projects. You've gotta have the complete suite of smart urban growth, and it's gotta be walkable and it's gotta be bikeable. Um, Rick Cochalis mentioned that um, in the, program, there is a guide. It's a very detailed guide to uh, federal, state, and local programs. It's not complete because there are many, many of them, um, but there's a guide to um, resources to do the infrastructure and the affordable middle income housing that we need to do in these TOD areas. Um, I'm happy to say that the feds um, started moving really probably as much as 10 years ago to recognize that programs like TIFIA and uh, 
the RIF, the Railroad Rehabilitation and Improvement Act, where by the way, there is a lot of cheap money with awesome repayment terms, um, that those programs, you know, were so focused on the big projects that they didn't support what we were needing in station areas, for example. And so I'm part of a national group. It's kind of the lobbying arm of the Urban Land Institute. It's called LOCUS. And we actually lobbied um, the Congress to reduce the, for example, the minimum amount for a TIFI alone and to make it available for TOD infrastructure. So that has worked, but it's a complicated federal program that uh, <clears throat> is not everybody's cup of tea. I'll sure, I'll, I'm sure you have that. Um, so would you um, move my next slide up, Kristen? Um, one of the best examples of TOD in the region, of course, is the Spring District in Bellevue. And that was a forward thinking decision by Wright Runstead, one of our original TOD developers. I mean, they built the, what was the Wamu Tower, you know, on top of the light rail station downtown and they integrated it with a station entrance. Um, but Wright Runstead and Shorenstein um, out of San Francisco bought what was the Safeway Distribution Center um, in, the, in Bell Red. And you've all been out there. Um, on, on this photo, you can see um, the um, Spark housing development on what would be the, the left side of the screen. You can see the light rail station under construction in a retained cut on the right side of the screen. You see the RAI campus, it's now Facebook there. Um, if you look, you can see part of the GIX um, uh, Innovative University Center uh, right there in the middle of the campus. It's got open space. It's got all new infrastructure. Now, that was a unique approach to infrastructure finance. I don't know how many of you know the way it worked, so it's not something that we can all turn to, but it's something we should think about as we're, we're building a heck of a lot more stations and light, and, and light rail stations in particular. And that is the city of Bellevue from back in 2009 um, established a catalyst program in their Bell Red sub area plan where you could reduce what you paid for additional density if you put in the infrastructure. So Wright Runstead, instead of paying the city of Bellevue for additional density and housing affordability, they put in all of the roads, all of the utilities, all of the open space. And um, in return for that, they got the, the approvals, the density to do what you're looking at today. So that's one way to finance the infrastructure. It's a obviously a station area program. Um, directly across um, 120th, you can see a little green spot. Um, I know what I'm looking at, you might not. That was our client, uh, Bernstead's Pine Forest. That was recently sold to Alexandria. It's gonna be three new life sciences buildings and at least two multifamily projects there. Off the screen to the right, just beyond in that right-hand corner, you can see the uh, dealership, the auto dealership kind of classic TOD, right? An automobile dealership. Um, well, you gotta get, gotta do something after you leave your car there for repairs. Um, anyway, off to the right is the um, operation and maintenance facility for uh, the east side uh, sound transits facility, which um, took a lot of work, but we've got a huge TOD project that's been squeezed out of that sound transit property. It's, um, combination of great vision by Touchstone and Urban Renaissance Group and um, Essex, um, which is a big multifamily REIT and bridge housing that's gonna do affordable housing. So a lot of good things happening there. Um, move the next slide if you would, Kristen. Okay. I think this is the John Lewis Bridge up at the Northgate Light Rail Station, which connects a you can see the light rail station kind of in the upper part of the photo and you can't see it, but the lower part of the photo is the connection to North Seattle College and lots of 
of developable areas to the to the west of Interstate Five. Now, this is a classic example of the right way. It was not easy. This project, by the way, almost died twice. Um, I'm happy to say I was out there yesterday and walked on it. Um, it's a classic way of combining, in this case, it was federal money, state money, city money. If we had not had Move Seattle, the uh, big bond issue, that might not, this might have happened. Um, so it was, there was a Tiger grant involved um, and there was sound transit dollars involved. So this is kind of the typical way we have to finance um, infrastructure. And it's a cobbling together all kinds of different resources from different uh, funding sources. Um, there is no magic bullet where you get everything you need with one, with one program. The good thing about this, and I'm really proud of SDOT, Seattle Department of Transportation that you know, spearheaded this, they combined this with all kinds of pedestrian and bicycle improvements around the, uh, the, the light rail station. So there are major bike routes now on both sides of Interstate 5 that are connected with this, um, the, the John Lewis Memorial Bridge. And of course, um, the timing was perfect. Normally you wouldn't um, say building a light rail station to a mall is the uh, ideal way to, to, to go, but in fact, we rode the uh, Blue Line extension in San Diego last week, and it ends up at a Weiss, uh, Weissfield Mall um, up by the uh, University of California, San Diego. But, you know, that's, it, that's a different kind of TOD. But what was fortuitous is Simon, at the same time, was planning on redeveloping the Northgate Mall, you know, 15 years after um, Thornton Village, you know, kind of the first big mixed use project out in the north end of Seattle. 15 years after that was the vision of the private sector. Um, now the mall is being redeveloped. And so this light rail station, this pedestrian bicycle bridge is more important than ever. I was gonna leave you with one thought about this piece of infrastructure. Cascade Bike helped save this um, twice. And they had really good data that showed that 92% of the people who would be using the light rail station would be, re, would be arriving and departing on foot or by, by bicycle. That's an extraordinary number, but that can happen in a lot of other TOD programs if we build the infrastructure. I mean, I'm a firm believer and I've seen it all over the country. We build that infrastructure and they will come. Next slide, Kristen. I wanna leave you with one other unique way of financing uh, infrastructure. And it, I'm gonna kind of contradict myself and say, this is kind of a one-stop approach. Um, it's unique though. This is the um, Microsoft um, or the Technology Center um, ped bike that connects the two Microsoft campuses over 520 at, um, at the Microsoft campus in Redmond. Microsoft was able to finance this through a community facilities district. Um, it's something that I helped and some of you on this webinar were with me on it. Um, we helped lobby the state legislature to create this vehicle. Um, it was before the, they started the baby TIFFs and, and Stacy's going to be talking about a, um, I'm going to call it an adolescent TIFF in just a minute, the new um, opportunities that we have with the new legislation. But this was financed because Microsoft essentially with the state legislation joined in the city with the city of Redmond to create a community facilities district that allowed for um, public finance of this whole structure. 
you know, Microsoft got, has got cash. We all know they've got cash, but they decided that they didn't want to use the cash for this. And so this is financed with long-term municipal bonds. They weren't hot two years ago when the interest rates or even a year ago when the interest rates were at 2%. But you know, with the rates now approaching five, which might be kind of normal, um, public finance vehicles are gonna become more attractive. And this is entirely financed with an assessment like an LID um, that applies to the, to the Microsoft property. And so they are able to finance this critical piece of bicycle pedestrian infrastructure to connect to the new light rail station at the technology center. Um, last slide, Kristen, I'm going to wrap up. So um, I focus primarily on the ped bike, open space utilities and why finding financing. And you've got, you know, how do you do it? You've got traditional local programs. We've all been working on, with LIDs most of our professional lives and with utility uh, improvement districts, ULIDs. Uh, we can still use those. We can use bond issues. We can use grant programs. And we can cobble those together with traditional state programs, like capital budget appropriations, economic development grants. Um, and there are many, many programs in the State Department of Commerce where there are loans and grants available for this kind of a program. But again, you have to cobble them together. There are new um, state approved um, op financing options. I, I mentioned community facilities districts. Um, Stacy's gonna talk a bit more about, uh, we, we, we finally are getting what um, 48 other states have had all along, which is tax increment financing. And there are other programs like Lyft, the state had previously approved. And then there's you know the federal programs um, for the jurisdictions, not, not so much for, well, definitely not for, well, I will say very few private developers. There are some in our national programs that take advantage of TIFIA or RRIF funds. Um, but for larger projects, and there are TIGER grants as well. Um, it's a matter of getting a list of all the potential programs, and Rick has assembled a a great list of those programs saying, which ones do we want to proceed, which, which will work for us. So I'm going to leave it at that and turn it back to, uh, to Rick. Over to me, I yeah, think yeah, so. Yeah, All right, I'll get my slides up. I'm Stacy Lewis. I'm a partner at Pacifica Law Group and I'm I'm a bond lawyer, uh, work with counties, cities, public universities, other municipalities on various uh, public finance tools. And I'm talking today, particularly about tax increment financing. Slides forward. And I have to say that I have been giving TIF talks and uh. <laughs> TIF and Washington state law for at least 20 years um, and for that. Jay Rich, and I'm sure Hugh Spitzer and other bond lawyers gave talks on TIF and Washington state law. And those talks were kind of a downer, um, jumping to the punchline because there have been real issues with marrying TIF as it's known all around the world. And as John said, in other states with uh, Washington state law. So the story of TIF in Washington has been a little tortured. We had our, as John called them, baby TIFs, and I called them TIF lights, where the legislature tried to really cobble together something TIF-like that also worked with some of the constraints of state law. Um, but today, this is a much more positive presentation because the latest uh, statutory TIF uh, passed just a couple sessions ago is the closest thing to real TIF that we've seen in Washington state since 1982 when the TIF statute was struck down by our Washington State Supreme Court. So this is uh, an upbeat TIF uh, presentation. Um, but TIF, very traditional public financing method around the world, 
for almost 70 years. Um, it's a value capture approach to public finance. And I have a little diagram on the next slide that really shows, shows that. But essentially, bonds issued to finance infrastructure public improvements in areas where that infrastructure investment expected to generate private investment and best value. And in most places, if AV goes up, property taxes that are calculated based on a rate per thousand of assessed value, as the assessed value increases, that translates into more property tax revenues that are then um, put to a debt service on the bonds that were issued to finance the public improvement in the first place. So that kind of value capture approach is a way to pay for the public infrastructure that attracts the development bump property taxes, put those property tax revenues back to pay the debt service on the bonds. In Washington, as, as I've said, we've had all sorts of issues making it work under state law and have leaned more heavily on uh, LIDs, which also are a form of value capture, but rather than uh, infrastructure that um, increases, you know, general property taxes being a debt service on the bonds, LIDs are a district formed, again, to finance public improvements, but the bonds are paid a special assessment on those particular property owners in the area whose property values have increased, received a special benefit from the that were that were made. So we've done a lot of um, value capture financing in Washington LIDs, local improvement districts, or utility local improvement districts, as opposed to using which is much more a tool than other states. And here's essentially the picture of the words I just used, which is you know, issue bonds, fund infrastructure, ports development, increase property values, get these tax bump from the rising property values uh, translated into a, a additional property tax revenues to pay off the bonds that started this cycle. And really the power of TIF is that property taxes are not paid simply to the entity that um, funded the improvement. That in, in a particular area, there are lots and lots of overlapping taxing districts. So here we're sitting taxing districts for city of Seattle, Port of Seattle, Seattle's Metropolitan Park District, uh, and I might, oh, the state of Washington, of course. Um, so lots of overlapping taxing districts and typically in a TIF mechanism, those property tax revenues that increase rising property values, whether they would go to the state or the county or the port or the city, regardless, they're all swept into the TIF mechanism that service on the bonds. So you have this amplifying impact of the value of the improvements um, generating increased property taxes. The tax is not dispersed everywhere, but captured in bonds. So the, I'll, I won't dwell on the, the issues we've had under state law, but I will say that the 1982 TIF statute was struck down because that, you know, all these overlapping taxing districts, taxes being swept into the TIF mechanism included the state property tax and under the Washington state constitution, state property taxes are dedicated to the support of the common schools and the Washington State Supreme Court found that inconsistent with having those taxes instead go to pay for debt service on bonds issued for the tip payments. So that's a constitutional issue and uh, absent amending the constitution, we'll never be able to sweep the, the state property taxes into a mechanism. Um, we've also dealt with the statutory issues associated with the Washington State's property tax scheme. It's a very complicated property tax structure. Uh, all the various Washington laws that, that govern how property taxes are, are imposed. And the key um, statutory issue has been the, what we call the 101% limitation. It arises from a series of first voter initiatives and then lots of uh, court decisions throwing those out on various technical infirmities and eventually the legislature just passing uh, a what is now a 101% limitation that says Basically, no matter how much assessed values increase, um, if you impose a rate per thousand and assessed values increase, cities and counties, everybody else can't really 
um, harvest that increased property tax revenues because there is a cap on the total dollar amount of property taxes that can be imposed. So a city or a county imp imposes a dollar amount and then that's converted into a, a rate per thousand. There is a cap on the total dollar amount of 1% plus a bump for new construction. And so it doesn't matter how much your investment has increased property values, um, you city county can only go up by 1% plus the bump for new construction. So that statutory limit really disrupts the TIF mechanism because you pull in property tax revenues that would be increased just from the increase in fee. But this is the key point here is the 101 is a statutory issue, not a constitutional. Honestly, sometimes that's not super clear down in Olympia. We get questions about the constitutional problem of the 101 percent. And there's a lot of sense that this thing is something you can't touch. Well, it's just a statutory limit and it's ended. And it was in this TIF legislation. So uh, new TIF legislation, it's codified at 39-114 RCW. And it tackled both of those issues, first by excluding the state property tax from the TIF mechanism, don't run into the constitutional issue. But then most importantly, also amending the 101% to say that if the instead of having the limit be the 1% plus the adjustment for new construction, um, the TIF mechanism can capture the additional increased property taxes associated with the increased AV in the TIF district. So specifically amended the 101 application to allow that. And just a little bit about the act. So uh, the, the, the statute allows counties, cities, and ports or a combination form TIF districts under this new statute um, and allows for this incre increment of property tax value to be translated into property taxes that are then sent to the sponsoring jurisdiction, the city, the county, and the port, to pay the debt service on bonds or to pay directly uh, costs of public improvements. And importantly for the conversation today, in terms of POD, the public improvements that are eligible for TIF financing include lots of the kinds of things that we are trying to, as John said, cobble together through these various sources that support all sorts of transit-oriented development. Um, so clearly just basic road infrastructure, streets and sidewalks, utility improvements, parking terminal and dock facilities. So talking uh, all sorts of things that are supportive of multimodal um, transit, whether it's you know light rail or rapid bus transit or passenger ferries, all, any of those sorts of facilities, park and ride facilities or other transit facilities, um, parks, uh, brownfield mitigation. And then another section that says other eligible costs include affordable housing, childcare facilities, other items on this slide. So lots of the kinds of things that need to uh, funded in order to support uh, OD. There are a number of um, uh, provisions, of course, in the statute that sort through how this property tax mechanism works. Um, it is not straightforward. Um, I will say that I think it's Eric Lowell at the MRSC who put together a really nice set of calculations on the MRC website that kind of walks through, okay, if you have a sponsoring jurisdiction and you form a TIF under this new statute, what happens in year one? What happens in year two? Who gets this piece? Who gets that piece? How does it all fit together? And it really, I, I recommend that to you. Read it. It kind of just walks through the math and you start to say, okay, I can, I can see how this fits, fits together. But basically, once the TIF is formed, the county treasurer is directed to send uh, regular property taxes as if they were before world to the various uh, taxing districts, um, and then the increment value to the sponsoring jurisdiction. And there's a definition of increment value um, is in the statute, and then the sponsoring jurisdiction needs to use that those revenues to pay costs of the public improvements. And they can agree to receive less than that full amount with the other jurisdiction, and the balance can go back to those who would have otherwise received it. Lots of procedural requirements. And this first piece is really key. Um, I would say that the statute, while it's real TIF, and you know, that's that's something something new, um, it is very much limited 
and in that sense is almost like a pilot project. And the key limitation is um, sponsoring jurisdiction is able to create one or two non-overlapping tier areas and the increment area has a cap on the AV. It can be no more than 200 million or 20% of the overall AV sponsoring jurisdiction. And $200 million of assessed value doesn't go very far if you're looking at, for example, around a transit station in Seattle or, you know, other, other cities. Um, so really a pilot in that sense. Um, and there is one example I'll touch on at the end of this, which is that Port of Pasco is well down the road on a uh, TIF financing under the new statute. And there it's... Uh, essentially building a new industrial development park. They're putting in some base infrastructure, water, sewer, to attract some industrial uh, development, including a dairy gold milk prop, uh, processing facility. So it's very much like you can get a lot of area, have $200 million an acre, and you know, under the statute that works uh, within the location, uh, you have to think about how the statute works in a uh, developed community around transit and how much you can uh, carve out when we're talking about a $200 AV. So uh, lots of other uh, requirements, including some very specific requirements that are kind of key to TIF, which is that you really want to only use this to fund infrastructure that truly attracts new development. If you're just funding infrastructure that um, you know, is sort of the, the, the usual course, then the upside is what would have potentially occurred anyway. And that that, you know, sweeping in the taxes into the TIF, you know, question whether that's really the, I mean, it's really not the nature of the TIF. This is it really intended to be fund improvements that attract private development and boost property values. And that's why it makes sense to pull those revenues back into the structure and not sort of take it from the there's a specific provision in the statute that takes into account whether fire protection districts or regional fire protection service areas are affected and whether you need to come to a uh, interlocal agreement with those entities. There's also a procedural requirement that you have to send a study to the state treasurer and the state treasurer has to review provide comments back. I, I, they've gone through that step for the Port of, Port of, Port of Pasco at this point. And kind of the bottom line that this new TIF Act really is quote unquote real TIF, at least minus the state property tax. It's fit in amount, so it really is a pilot in that regard. Um, I think that the thinking through how the, the math works with the various overlapping taxing districts, sponsoring jurisdiction, it really will require a lot of communication with your, your overlapping taxing districts to, to be on the same page about this being a project that, that is appropriate for, for TIF. And the example on, on the Port of Pasco I've mentioned is pretty far down the road with TIF under the statute. We've had questions from lots of other cities and, and uh, municipalities about the new statute, um, the, 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 the issue about the $200 million AV is a pause point for, for some, but I know there are other jurisdictions that are thinking about going down. Path. I guess in terms, because I'm a bond lawyer, I should have said that the way that the finance piece of this actually works is the sponsoring jurisdiction is authorized under the statute to issue either general obligation bonds or revenue bonds be paid from the TIF revenues. Um, realistically, it's probably general obligation bonds, which means on your port is putting its general fund on the line, probably pledging its full faith and credit. And so a key thing to think about is what sort of um, project and what sort of projections, what sort of, sort of comfort from private parties with the city, county, or port really require to issue general obligation bonds that are intended to be paid from the fifth mechanism, but absent the projected AV increases materializing, there is um, risk on the Report. So there'd be a lot of analysis behind, uh, you know, the, the the project before the city county court would probably go out and limit the general obligation bonds to fund these public improvements. So uh, that's that's the more upbeat 
uh, TIFF presentation with a real, real TIFF in Washington. And I think over to you. All right, welcome, Nick. Uh, you can uh, share your screen and join uh, the group here. Uh, appreciate your being here with us. Yeah, thank you so much for the invitation. And please bear with me while I uh, fumble through screen sharing here. Uh, can you see this okay? Uh, I'm not hearing anything from you there. Is, uh, Just go on a full screen if you can, Nick. Yeah, let me uh, jump into that real quick here. And uh, are you seeing my um, display slides or the presenter's view? Still not full screen. There you go. That, that works right there. Okay, excellent. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for the invitation to join the conversation today. and. Um, also, thanks to John and Stacy for, for great presentations. Those were very informative. Um, I'd like to build on a little bit of what uh, both of them spoke about um, and talk about what I think we'll, we'll call a form of TIF light and how that ties into uh, TOD and some of the work that Quotera has been doing on the regional scale. So if you're not familiar with our organization, just a little bit of background. We're a regional conservation and sustainability organization focusing primarily on uh, land use issues. So be that conservation policy, uh, market-based tools. Uh, we also do quite a bit of restoration and more recently have ventured into the realm of affordable housing. Uh, this, this is not news to anyone, but I think it helps to set the stage for the conversation. Um, as Josh mentioned in his introductory comments, we're seeing a lot of growth and that is continuing even through the pandemic. Um, so we need to think about how are we going to uh, shape the future of our region uh, in a way that reflects our regional growth strategy. To back up a little bit and take a longer view, we take an aerial view of the region. Uh, this is more or less what the land use patterns look like today. Uh, with these yellow lines representing our municipal boundaries and urban growth areas within the Central Puget Sound region um, and uh, the rest of the, the landscape kind of more off to the east here. But if we project forward and look at what this region could conceivably look like in the year 2100, if the region builds out to existing zoning, then we end up with uh, quite a bit of conversion of the rural and resource lands uh, that are outside of our urban growth areas. And uh, this is not a sustainable future uh, for the region. So the question then is, how do we move from an alternative vision of this to something more like this, where we can accommodate the same amount of growth, but more efficiently within a smaller footprint? So this picture here, actually contains the same amount of growth as this. Um, and you can see there's a little bit more growth than where we are today outside the uh, uh, municipal and urban growth area boundaries, uh, but it's certainly um, a more sustainable version of the landscape um, than if we have full build, build out uh, rural areas. So how do we get to this future? You know, one tool that Torterra has been heavily invested in is taking, uh, using the market, uh, taking market-based approaches uh, to direct growth into areas where it's more appropriate. And transfer of development rights is a big part of that. Um, so it's a brief overview. Uh, this is a real estate tool that gives landowners additional choices for what to do with their land. Um, it's not any longer just the choice between keeping it and continuing to farm or use it for open space or resource purposes versus selling it, in which case it might be developed, um, but it allows landowners to simply sell the development potential from their land, and that can be purchased and uh, relocated and applied to um, construction projects in urban areas where growth is more desirable. So a landowner can sell their development rights in the form of uh, TDR credits they retain ownership of their land, they retain all of their uses, they just can't build. And the 
the development potential that could have gone on those farms or forests. Things get gets moved to cities or urban areas uh, where we have all those things that make for more complete communities, infrastructure, jobs, schools, transit, parks, etc. So this is uh, it's all voluntary, it's all market-based. Nobody has to participate in the program or use this tool, um, but it's there as an incentive. If a developer thinks that they can uh, gain additional value through adding building height or constructing more units of the project, uh, they can access that bonus by using TDR uh, through um, private market transactions and buying these credits from landowners. So that's the general overview of this tool, and that's going to factor into um, the rest of the presentation. And TDR works. There are quite a few programs in the region, and collectively, uh, they've conserved about 145,000 acres over the past 25, 30 years or so. Uh, and this does work across multiple jurisdictions. Um, and one really great example of this uh, that I think ties into our theme of, of TOD is a relatively recent success in Sonoma County. Um, developer uh, proposed this project Vantage 2, which is at the intersection of Highway 99 and State Route 525. And um, this is in the multifamily residential zone within unincorporated Sonoma County. And by using transfer of development rights, the developer was able to add an additional 127 units of housing to this affordable senior housing complex. And on the flip side of that, um, in rural Snohomish County, um, the sale of development rights resulted in the conservation of a farm and a forest of property. And I really like this example because it shows that the, the tool can be used at a variety of scales. Um, we'll see in a little bit how it's been used effectively in high-rise development in downtown Seattle. But I also want to highlight that this tool can be effective um, in smaller scale development as long as there's demand for growth, TDR can, um, can function effectively. So where else is this being used? Um, there are 15 cities around the region that uh, have TDR programs in place. All four of the counties in the PSRC region have TDR programs. And there are also two regional scale programs um, that were created through state law. Um, and then of this list, those jurisdictions that are in bold, uh, those are programs that Corterra has had some role either in the design or update uh, or shaping somehow of those programs. And I just wanted to highlight that as um, a sign of the, uh, the importance that we place in our investment in the use of this tool on a regional scale. So for the next portion of our chat here, I wanted to focus on this last one, Elclip, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, and this is the stands for the Landscape Conservation and Local Infrastructure Program, and this is one of the, uh, the junior TIF or TIF light type programs um, that John and Stacy mentioned earlier. And while I did have a relatively minor hand in the design of this program, we're really lucky that Stacy is here because she's actually the person who drafted the, the legislation. So. Um, if you can stump me, hopefully Stacy can answer any question that, that I'm not able to um, about this tool. But in short, um, this is a, uh, at the time was a novel approach, um, was adopted in 2011, and it combines transfer of development rights with tax increment financing. And the genesis of this program came from feedback we've heard from cities. Um, already by this point, we'd been working with a lot of cities, encouraging them to adopt transfer of development rights, policy and regulations. And a common theme we were hearing from these partners was that they were having a hard time providing services and infrastructure to their existing populations. And that if they were anticipating more growth and offering incentives like TDR, something that would create a lot of value for them would be uh, additional funding resources to pay for infrastructure that would support that growth. So essentially the, the birth of this program came about um, as a means to create a financial incentive 
for cities to adopt TDR programs. And tip, um, OCLIP is um, enabled by statute uh, 39.108 in the RCW. And it creates a regional TDR program spanning three counties. So that's King, Pierce, and Snohomish. And within that geography, 35 cities are eligible. So it's not every city within those three counties, but it's the uh, 35 largest. Uh, so the criterion for qualifying uh, is combined population and deployment of 22,500. So if a city reaches that threshold, uh, they can participate in the program. At the time, the idea was um, about 75% of the anticipated future growth in the region would go into those 35 cities. Uh, so that was where we wanted to focus the benefit of this tool. Uh, the conservation potential is noteworthy. The, if all 35 cities were to participate uh, to the full extent possible, it could conserve uh, 650,000 acres of rural and resource lands. And to put that in context, what does that number really mean? Um, that's about three times the area of Mount Rainier National Park. So that's a pretty substantial area of conservation throughout the, the Tri-County region that the program could generate. So how does this work? Um, well, thankfully, Stacy gave such a great overview of uh, the other TIF program in her presentation that um, uh, I think that it's there's really not much to add to that um, other than the few unique characteristics that are specific to this program. Um, and speaking of unique, this is unique nationally. This is the only program in the United States that um, creates a regional voluntary transfer of development rights marketplace um, of, in this nature. So um, it's, it's great to see the innovation and success of this program so far here in Central Puget Sound. Uh, so the way it works is um, the city gets to retain a portion of its county's share of property tax revenue on new construction for up to 25 years. So just like the program that Stacy described. Um, the, the added wrinkle here is that in exchange for receiving that revenue, cities must commit to accepting TDR credits from the counties. So it's uh, conservation that the counties receive and then um, cities get the revenue benefit. Um, so what's in this for the counties? Well, they uh, supported the creation of this program because they get the conservation benefit of um, through the private market. And then they also um, have lower future costs of service and infrastructure as development potential is removed from rural areas. Uh, so similar to the other TIF program, this runs for up to 25 years. And uh, there are a couple other nuances as well, um, which I'll get into. And I think this graphic here uh, shows the, um, the dynamics a little more clearly, where on the left, if you uh, are a city and you grow and you do not have this program in place, um, as new construction happens, your assessed value increases, your tax base grows, and so effectively your, your property tax buy gets bigger. And it's roughly broken down in these proportions with the, the different taxing districts. Uh, under Elkhood, if a city chooses to participate in this program, uh, as, the, as new construction happens, the tax base grows, um, that new construction uh, revenue from that, the cities can keep a portion of the share that would otherwise go to the county. So on the right-hand side there, you see that um, the blue portion that in that outer ring um, is bigger for cities because they get to keep um, not all, but some of what would otherwise go to the county, up to a maximum of 75% over the 25-year time span of the program. Um, and what's great about this revenue is that uh, it's very flexible in nature. Um, it has to be spent on infrastructure, but that can include things like our traditional infrastructure that you think of uh, transit, utilities, um, so forth, um, but also parks and streetscapes and um, facilities that support affordable housing and maintenance. Actually, all the same things that um, Stacy mentioned in her presentation. The revenue from this can also be used by cities as matches 
for other grants. So as John astutely observed, um, the funding picture that, that cities uh, have to piece together can be really a patchwork of different sources. And Elcliffe adds an interesting component to that because it is so flexible and kind of self-directed. Um, so in that case, it's not a magic wand and it won't solve um, everybody's infrastructure problems, but I think it is a valuable tool that cities can, uh, can contemplate uh, to round out and uh, diversify their, their revenue portfolio to support infrastructure. So I'd like to illustrate a couple of examples of where this tool is being used or is almost being used um, to highlight how it can, can be uh, applied um, in different circumstances. Uh, so the first adoptee of Elclip is the city of Seattle and they jumped in in 2013. So very shortly after the creation of the tool and the city enrolled um, much of its urban core. So pretty much everything in the downtown area from the Southern shore of Lake Union to the international district is the area that Seattle enrolled in its um, Elclip geography. And similar to um, the other TIF program, um, there are limits on how much assessed value a city can enroll. And I believe the limit for Elkliff is 25% of assessed value. And uh, at the outset, the city of Seattle chose to place 800 development rights in that geography and anticipated that over a 20 year period of growth, um, new construction would be able to place 800 development rights and that would equate to, you know, maybe 50 or 60,000 acres of conservation. Well, the reality has been a little different. Um, just in the first seven or eight years of implementation of the program, new construction in these neighborhoods has resulted in over 1,200 development rights being placed. Uh, and I think that number is actually a little low. Um, it, it changes every month as more projects um, are, uh, are placing credits as they're built. And so that's actually a little closer to 1,500, I believe. Um, but the upshot is that as a result of this, over 100,000 acres of farm and forest land in King County have been permanently conserved um, as a result of these market-based transactions. To put that area into context, um, of the 220 some transfer of development rights programs that are in use around the United States. Um, the next biggest program in terms of acres conserved is about 50,000 acres. And that program has been in place since 1984. Uh, so in seven or eight years, the city of Seattle has more than doubled the amount of conservation um, that the next biggest program has been able to achieve over a you know, 30 plus year timeline. So, I think that really speaks both to the effectiveness of the tool and um, also the pace of growth and how well that TDR has been aligned with that market here in Seattle. So how much revenue is the city anticipating? Uh, well, the original forecast was about $30 million over the 25 year revenue period of the program. Um, in reality, that's probably going to be more as the pace of new construction has exceeded uh, the original forecasts. Um, but uh, that's all uh, that's all new money that the city otherwise would not have had access to to support neighborhood improvements. And the city has identified um, improved streetscaping, uh, better mobility in South Lake Union, um, acquiring and upgrading parks, and building a community center. So these are all the, um, the public improvements that the city is planning to do or is already doing um, with this revenue. And like um, with uh, the TIF program that, that Stacy mentioned, there is the option for cities to use this by bonding upfront against anticipated revenues. Um, this has um, so far not been the, ch the, the choice of cities in how they have implemented the tool the city of Seattle has instead preferred to just collect the money and save it up um, as it comes in on an annual basis and then spend it as they collect it. Uh, so that reduces the risk to the city of being on the hook for additional debt 
um, however, the timing of the revenue doesn't necessarily align as closely um, with the timing of the growth. So we've seen a ton of growth in the last seven years, um, and only now um, the revenue pay, annual revenue payments are, are really starting to heat up. And it's as we saw in that earlier slide, um, it's really towards the, the tail end of the program where um, the revenue is the highest uh, in just through the um, uh, the power of compounding growth. So these are this is um, this one snapshot of how Seattle is using the tool. And as a kind of on the different end of the spectrum, the city of Shoreline, immediately to the north, is currently in the process of um, um, drafting revisions to its development code and drafting legislation that would also um, add it to the program. So should it choose to join the program, Shoreline would be the second city uh, in the region to use it. And there's a little different application here. Um, there's a very different geography. As you can see, the, the program, as it's envisioned by the city, um, is within these, uh, these lines on, on, the, um, on the map here. So all of town center, which is more or less the corridor along Highway 99, as well as the two light rail station neighborhoods, and then a couple of the neighborhood business districts. So in aggregate, about 25% of the city's assessed value. Uh, so you've got the major uh, transit corridor along 99, you've got the light rail station neighborhoods, and then also these corridors that connect the light rail station neighborhoods to um, the town center. So um, very different scale. Uh, the city of Shoreline would contemplate placing 231 credits, which is um, less than Seattle has. Um, and the conservation potential is also low, but scale to the, the size of the city. Uh, and the revenue potential there is uh, somewhere between 19 and 25 million. And the uh, public improvements that the city has identified that it would want to invest in is more park acquisition in the um, growing neighborhoods, uh, mobility improvements to connect the light rail station areas to town center, and then also to build a non-motorized bridge over I-5 to really um, somewhat akin to what John highlighted um, in his presentation to really expand access to the station area from the west side of Interstate 5. So um, again, this is uh, underway. The city is in the process of um, drafting code amendments and so forth uh, to set this up. Uh, so it's not a guarantee by any stretch that the city will choose to join the program, but um, should it go that direction, uh, this is what it might look like. Uh, so just to recap, uh, LCLIP essentially creates a financial incentive for cities to use TDR. Uh, the revenue is really flexible um, and it's a very low risk program for cities to use. A uh, common question that I hear from staff and city council members, uh, what happens if we aren't able to meet the obligations of the program? Um, and the answer is, well, there's really no, you know, there are really no adverse consequences. The city gets to keep all of the revenue that it has collected so far. There's no early termination fee. There's no, you don't have to give back any of the money that you've already collected. Um, and so it, it, it really does lower the risk of participation to cities. Um, if they do choose to bond, they will, of course, um, be responsible for the, the debt liability. Uh, but just in terms of the revenue from, uh, from the counties, um, it's a very low risk proposition. And it really integrates some uh, really important regional scale uh, objectives that we're embracing in the Puget Sound Regional Council area uh, by combining growth, investment in communities and conservation all in the same place and through the same tool. Uh, so not only does LCLIP support the objectives of Vision 2050 in the regional growth strategy, but it also supports the regional goals through the uh, open space strategy as well. And with it being market-based, um, it does give cities and counties uh, more flexibility for what they want to do with their other revenue because um, they don't necessarily need to expend taxpayer money um, to invest in or support the program. Um, it can be a very light touch 
uh, from the from the public perspective as well. Uh, so those are some of the main highlights of the program to recap. Um, and then from the city's perspective, if they want to use the tool, uh, this, the traditional starting point is to conduct a feasibility study, hire consultants to answer the big questions. Uh, the main things that cities want to know are how much money are we talking about? What is the revenue potential? And then what is what are the um, optimum scenarios uh, for configuring the program in a way that will maximize revenue and direct growth where it's best suited and maximize the conservation potential. Uh, so then in so doing, the city would go forward and create a TDR program. Um, if cities already have one, as many of them do, then that's an advantage. Um, they're already a few steps ahead. And if not, no problem. Uh, we welcome other cities also uh, creating TDR programs. And then they designate which geography, which district or districts in the city they want to include, uh, where they anticipate growth, where they would place development rights through new construction. Um, and then the final step is to adopt the ordinance that would implement using LCLIP. Um, so those are broad brush strokes. Uh, there are certainly nuances within this um, progression, but uh, at, at a high level, these are the steps that a city would want to contemplate if it wanted to join this program and use the tool. Um, so that is it for me at uh, kind of the introductory level. There are some more resources out there if you want to learn more. We have some great videos on our website that um, describe TDR and LCLIP. Uh, both in Seattle and at the regional scale. And the State Department of Commerce um, has a great repository of information and resources on its website as well. So um, I'll leave this up for a second, and then um, this will also be available, I think, uh, after the program if you want these links. Thanks to John, Stacy, and Nick for their presentations. And if you can stay with us for a few more minutes, we have the opportunity for questions and answers. We're going to alternate between those present here in the room. And then uh, Laura uh, has picked up some ones um, from our uh, virtual piece. So uh, what do we have? Uh, go ahead. Hi, I'm Joanna Fugates. I'm with Sound Transit. Um, I had a question actually to Stacy and then to Nick. So Stacey, uh, I was curious on the use of TIF for affordable housing and childcare facility. Is that more in the sense of gap financing or can it actually be used for acquisition and development? I'll help if I turn on my mic. Um, now the language is pretty broad. It allows costs of affordable housing and you know, certainly it would depend on sort of the vigor of the TIF mechanism in terms of how much, how much money is actually gonna be produced by uh, forming the TIF district. But, whatever funds are produced, affordable housing is, is an eligible expenditure. So there aren't any limits in terms of um, how much of it you could put to affordable housing. Thank you. And my question to Nick was um, related to the T TDR. So my understanding is that um, the air rights, the, they don't need to be transferred from immediately adjacent properties. It can be anything within the area that is created. So I'm wondering what happens to properties that may be grandfathered in um, because they decide the zoning has changed and they decided they don't want to sell, they don't want to develop, and they're transferring the air rights. But in a few years, the property may come to the end of its life and they can no longer rebuild what is there because the zone doesn't allow anymore. Has that been thought through? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. It's a little outside the scope of this program because um, with the regional transfer of development rights marketplace, uh, the conservation emphasis is really on farms and forests. Um, but I don't think we've encountered a scenario yet where um, a building has been constructed with bonus density um, that is then either, you know, it had to be replaced for some reason. Uh, so that question of does the additional density uh, live on with the property. Um, I think that that's still an open question unless uh, John or Stacy, you have any insight on that. I'm not familiar with um, any example of that happening so far. 
All right. Our next question is, how will the TIF district affect properties that use uh, LIHCC, MPTE, et cetera? Are these programs compatible? I'll, I'll hand that. You know, I, I have uh, an affordable housing expert <laughs> call my friend. The situation here is one of my partners, Faith Pettis, is, is here. And this is a much better question for Faith, actually, if you don't mind. This is a, a using your one lifeline. Is that what this is, Stacey? <laughs> <laughs> so um, the low-income housing tax credit, the LIHTC, is not payable from property taxes at all. So it should not affect, the TIF district would not affect that at all. And, and getting back to the question that was asked earlier about the use for affordable housing, Stacy's absolutely right. It depends on how robust the TIF revenues are. But generally speaking, like John Hempelman was saying, affordable housing projects are cobbling together many, many sources of funding in order to put together one source is usually never sufficient to finance affordable housing, especially in a high cost area around TOD. As far as MFTE, I think that would just be one of the basic taxes, right, Stacy? that would be paid first before the, in, the increment? Yeah, it would just be away. an existing exemption, you know, right. it would just continue as it was, it wouldn't affect it. Right. right. Peter, did you have questions? I do, thank you, Rick. First of all, I want to commend you on a, such a wonderful conference, ULI and PSRC, and this is, learned a lot, I got three pages of notes already, and I've got lots of questions, but in the interest of time, I'm going to ask uh, just one, and this one is of, of Nick, um, has to do with the TDR program, and it's a three-part question, Nick. Um, first of all, how is the value of, of TDR credits assessed, and uh, is there any consideration given to the distance of the preserved property from the TDR site? And lastly, you know, who gets the money that results from the um, conversion of those credits into cash, and uh, how is that uh, how is the determination of where it's going to be used for preservation? Um, great questions. Please uh, bring me back on track if I um, miss any of those components. First of all, valuation. Um, development rights are a real estate asset and can be bought and sold on a private market just like any other real estate tool or component. So just like buying and selling your house, uh, landowners have expectations around how much they want to get for selling their development rights. Likewise, the buyer uh, has some willingness to pay. So the simple answer is um, they're worth what someone's willing to pay and what someone's willing to accept. Uh, so those are for transactions on the private market. If, however, you have some public entity uh, participating in the marketplace, and a great example of this is the King County Transfer of Development Rights Bank, where they actually uh, use public funds to go out and buy development rights uh, and then sit on them and then sell them later on to developers, they're using public funds. So they're constrained um, by limitations on that. And valuation in that case is determined by uh, third party appraisal. So the short answer is for private market transactions, uh, it's just negotiation between the parties. And then if public money is involved, valuation is by appraisal. Um, is there a difference in value based on proximity between the um, conserved land and the urban areas. Um, there are lots of factors that go into uh, determining the value of um, development rights. Proximity can certainly be one of them, can be uh, developability. Um, you know, imagine a, an upland piece of farmland close to Everett um, that's near a main road and has easy access to utilities that'll be much more desirable and have greater development potential than an 80 acre parcel of forest land on a steep slope in Eastern King County. Uh, so the developability, the development pressures, um, the physical attributes, the proximity, there are lots of attributes that, um, that influence the, uh, uh, the valuation of the, of the development rights. In terms of who receives the value, the money of the, uh, from the sale stays with the landowner. So if you're a farmer and you want to sell some or all of your development rights, you can sell them to the King County, Pierce County, and Snohomish County banks. Uh, you can sell them directly to a developer that wants to use them in an urban project, but you get to keep all that money. Um, and that is yours for, you know, if you want to invest in your operation, you want to send your kid to college, um, you, know, you want to buy more land to expand your farm. Those are all common things that we hear from 
uh, landowners who are selling their development rights. Hopefully that answers all three parts of your question. All right, next question is, uh, and I think you touched on this, Stacey, what is holding back jurisdictions from using the new TIF legislation? Well, it is very new. So um, I think you're probably at the point of jurisdictions becoming familiar with the legislation, sort of digesting what, what's, what's involved, thinking through um, the potential applications in their jurisdiction and probably thinking about some modeling to understand how much a TIF district would produce revenues to finance public improvements. Um, there's, a, you know, the statute is relatively complex, so it would require all of that analysis to decide whether to proceed. Um, so I think that there'll be additional jurisdiction to work through, understand the statute and think about whether there's an application um, the question, the pause we have heard from some of the, the more uh, urban cities is the limitation on the 200 million and um, translates in some places into a you know, small TIF district that it may not be uh, compelling in terms of the steps. It, not a lot of bang for the buck, but early days. On. So if they're enough like Pasco, if they're successful, if someone else does it, and it just be successful, then back to the legislature and say, okay, this is done well, stable. Let's see if we can increase this. Yeah, yeah, I do think some track record is always very helpful. People can see how it's out um, and then potentially having the statute expand. That's really a pilot approach at this point. I want to thank everyone for coming, uh, both virtually and uh, here in person, and our speakers, uh, both the panel and the introductory remarks. Um, it's been great, uh, really very positive. Uh, there is uh, AICP uh, credits for this uh, seminar and an email with the information on the slides and the um, uh, finance guide that will be sent to registered attendees next week. Um, and for those of you who want to stick around, uh, ULI is going to by a ULI marketplace. First time we've done that for those who can stick with us. It may just be one small group. Uh, we, we thought we might be more folks and folks registered, but, but just continue the conversation and uh, share information, uh, sort of best practices. And we'll have a 15 minute break and we'll reconvene for those who want to stick around for that. That's just for the in-person attendees. So again, uh, thank you.